Hey everybody, so I had a really great conversation today with a compounding pharmacist and we got talking about the hormone replacement therapy delivery methods, which ones I like, which ones I don't like, which ones I use more frequently, which ones I see better clinical results with. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to repackage it, reframe it, for this video to give you a bit more ammunition when you are looking into whether hormone replacement therapy is a good approach for you and also different things to discuss with your physician if they are set on doing one particular method that you might agree with, you might not agree with, but maybe this video will help give you a bit more insight into that. And so there are five main delivery methods that I tend to think of. There's a few other weird random ones, but there's five main delivery methods. There's an oral capsule, there's injectable, there's topical creams, there's sublingual, so that's gonna be our trochees and things like that, and then there's the hormone pellets. And the hormones that are gonna be in discussion here are going to be uh, DHEA, pregnenolone, progesterone, estrogen, and estriol, as well as testosterone. And so the first thing I'll say is the uh, hormones that I'm okay doing oral are gonna be DHEA, pregnenolone, and micronized progesterone, uh, which you can also get the, pharma the full pharmaceutical version, Prometrium. Same thing, it's a micronized progesterone that's bioidentical. Those there are safe on the liver, and so there is no major detriment or no harm to the body at the dosages that most people are gonna be taking on the liver. And so we have to consider the liver when we take anything orally because of what's called the first pass effect. The first pass effect is basically that when you ingest something through the mouth, it goes into the stomach, it, when it gets absorbed into the blood, it has to go through the liver first before it goes systemically to the rest of the body. And that is this pr little protective mechanism that our bodies have created in order to protect us from certain things. That way we don't ingest them, they don't go directly into our bloodstream and go all throughout our body. They have to pass through the liver first because the liver is our detoxification organ or one of the main detoxification organs. And so, we have to consider the first pass effect. We have to consider the fact that anything that hits the liver could potentially harm the liver. And so some of the older oral uh, steroids, the you know androgen anabolic steroids, the oral estrogens, those things seem to have increased risk of liver damage, potentially liver cancer. And so there's been a push away from the oral capsules and things like that. But the safe ones are gonna be DHEA, pregnenolone, and progesterone. Now, when we look at estrogen, so I, we don't wanna be taking estrogen orally for the reason we just stated. There isn't really estrogen available in injectable form, at least it's bioidentical. And so that leaves us with topical creams. Now, topical creams work well for many men and women, depending on uh, what we are needing uh, in each individual. And then there's just some considerations that we have to have with them, which is how well their body absorbs it, how well they metabolize it. And so, so we will eventually need to more than likely adjust the dose within each patient just based on how well they absorb things through the skin, how well their liver handles the, uh, the estrogen and things like that. So when we then move to testosterone, Testosterone now is where we can start to see many different avenues. We can do testosterone in an injectable, we can do testosterone in a sublingual trochee, we can do testosterone in a transdermal cream. Those are the three main ways, and I'm gonna wait and talk about the hormone pellets in a second. So in men, my preferred method of delivering the testosterone is gonna be an injection. In women, if they're just on uh, testosterone replacement therapy and no other hormones, then I do tend to prefer the injections as well, just because it's you'd have to do it less often, so you only have to do it once every 
five to 10 days, depending on which uh, form of testosterone we're using. And we seem to get a little bit better uh, stable levels over time. Whereas with the, um, the for example, the, the creams, you have to apply it daily. Sometimes that's an issue. There's, there can be a lot more transfer from the hands over to other surfaces and contaminating other people in the house, which could be dangerous if you have kids, things like that. So if a woman is just doing testosterone replacement therapy and nothing else, which is a pretty rare scenario to begin with, then I'm typically gonna do an injectable. However, if she is on um, estrogen replacement therapy, which is gonna be in a cream, it's really easy to just add the testosterone into the cream and have it done all at once. That way they don't have to do a topical application plus an injection, and then they're also on progesterone doing an oral capsule. And so if we can just keep it to even putting the progesterone in the cream, if the patient doesn't need the sleep benefits of the oral progesterone, then we can put all four in a cream. However, if they do suffer from some insomnia or lack of sleep, things like that, then we can add, we can do the, the bias, which is gonna be your estriol, your estradiol, and the testosterone in a cream, and then move the progesterone into an oral capsule. So with men though, so we have the injectable, we have the cream, then we also have the trochee, and the trochee you can also do in women. Now, I am personally not a big fan of trochee. So the whole idea behind a trochee is it's sublingual, and a lot of it's gonna get absorbed sublingually. When it gets absorbed sublingually, it goes directly into the bloodstream, and you don't get as much of the first pass effect, meaning not as much hits the liver. However, just it doesn't really pan out that way. And even when you look at a lot of the research, you are still getting 70% or so of that medication is getting swallowed in saliva because when you hold something in your tongue, you make more saliva. That's, you don't just sit there with the saliva under your tongue for a few hours for that to dissolve you end up swallowing that. And so you still end up swallowing a large majority of the hormone, which could potentially cause some issues with the liver. I don't think there have been a lot of great long-term studies on the effects of the, uh, of the oral or the sublingual hormones on the liver, but based off of what we've seen in the past with the oral androgens, oral estrogen, those types of things, I, I just, I'm not comfortable going down that rabbit hole of potentially putting someone at risk and harming their liver just to do a trochee when we have other forms that are safer. And so that's kind of why I stay away from trochees. And so the other aspect is the, uh, the hormone pellets. And so, the hormone pellets, in theory, are also great. You go into the physician's office, they put hormones in a pellet underneath the skin that stays there for three months. One procedure, which is like a mini minor surgical procedure, one minor surgery every three months, and your levels are gonna stay beautiful and nice and flat line, and you won't have the up and down of the injections and the, the creams and things like that. Theoretically, it's amazing. Realistically, it doesn't, there's, I've, I have had so many patients come into my office and are screwed up from having a pellet put in, it's usually their first or second pellet, having a pellet put in and the dose was way too high for that patient despite that being a normal starting dose. And so one of the things you have to consider is that every person, every body is going to absorb things at a different rate. We're going to metabolize things at a slightly different rate and we're gonna excrete things at a slightly different rate. And so in one person, you could give them whatever milligram of testosterone in a hormone pellet and in another person, you could give them the exact same thing and they are gonna have completely different responses. One might be too much of a dose, one might be too little. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, too much or too little could also happen when we are doing the injections of the creams, and that's 100% true. That's not the issue. The issue is that that pellet now stays in you for three months. So let's step back and look at this. We put a pellet in you that has 
hormones, testosterone, which if that goes too high, could increase your risk of a cardiovascular event because it's going to increase red blood cell production, potentially increase clotting. So if we put you into super physiological ranges of testosterone, it could increase your risk of having a heart attack along with some other side effects, aggression, irritability, hair loss, things like that. But if you start noticing those symptoms four weeks in, guess what? You're told to go donate blood to get rid of the excess hematocrit, so you, it decreases your risk of having a heart attack, but you're, you're stuck with it for another eight weeks until that pellet is gone. And that, to me, does not make any sense in my philosophy of how I approach hormone replacement therapy. The other aspect that I think about a lot, which a lot of other physicians don't think about, is the amount of scarring that is gonna take place with repeated insertions of these pellets. So let's take an example. You get these pellets done every three months, that's four a year. On average, most women and men are gonna be on hormone replacement therapy for three years or longer. And so let's say we do minimum three years. That's 12 different minor surgical procedures along your lower back where there's fascia, there's muscle tissue, there's nerves, there's a high risk for changing the fascial planes and with our back and our core being the central aspect of our body, that can be a huge potential area for there to be dysfunction, not just in the immediate future, but what happens when you're 60, 70, 80 years old and your mobility and strength already starts to go down. So I start to get concerned about the physical implications of having these continual procedures done. And so that's why I tend to stick to capsules for a few of those hormones. That's gonna be DHEA, pregnenolone, and progesterone. I stick with injectable for testosterone, and then creams we can do the testosterone, we can do the estrogens, which is gonna be estradiol and estriol. We can also add in DHEA and progesterone if we'd like, depending on the patient. I hope that gives you guys some insight into the realm of hormone replacement therapy, how I think about it, how I work and treat with my patients. If you enjoyed this, please let me know in the comments. Let me know which aspects you found most interesting so that I can make sure that I'm creating the content that you guys want to see. See you later.